Dennis Holowinski, legendary vegetation management industry leader, joins us to talk about how he got his start in the industry. He talks about his challenges with liability and insurance in California, how he helped hundreds of utilities build their first veg management program, and more. Have a listen. Hope you enjoy. Well, welcome, Dennis. I really appreciate having you with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you. You know, so many out there listening today at one time worked with you, worked for you, or whatever. So I think uh, our audience is going to really be excited to hear what you have to say. Well, I'm glad uh, to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm sitting here in Dennis. sunny Florida just uh, looking out at the beautiful weather, so I'm good. I like so it. for those that don't know the name, I just say that, you know, almost everything we take for granted in the utility vegetation management industry, uh, we can bring back to you making it mainstay of the industry. You got it started, you laid the foundation, and it uh, really a pretty cool story. So I hope you share that with us today. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started. And Well, uh, my background is I'm a graduate of landscape architecture from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, we studied uh, landscape architecture, regional planning, that kind of thing. Um, I then went to work for the highway department in Dixon, Illinois, uh, for two years. After designing everything that they needed to be designed, I was getting bored. <clears throat> I even designed a scenic overlook at uh, the Quad Cities. And uh, so that was, after I got that done, they didn't have anything for me to do. So uh, <clears throat> I looked for a job and then I got a, went out east. My brother was working for a company called Aspen Tree Company. so. I went out east, uh, they hired me, and they wanted me to run their environmental department. They had no idea what that was. Uh, all I know is they wanted to, they wanted, their idea was, oh, we want you to landscape substations. I said, okay. Well, we never did much of that, but <laughs> it was a great experience. And uh, so I worked for them for, oh, maybe 15 years. Uh, I then uh, bought the company and started Environmental Consultants, Inc., and all the rest is history. So you started off la landscaping substation, and I remember designing parks in Philly. How did you transition to the utility side? Well, let's start from the beginning. First, we went to the highway department. They had me mowing grass. I know nothing about mowing grass or buying tractors or any of that stuff. Uh, then, of course, we got to the uh, doing a lot of uh, design work for the city of Philadelphia. We did a lot of work for the Bicentennial. We did parks and we did the major parkways and all the squares and that kind of stuff. One of the, uh, I don't know if you people know Bramble and Burns. Uh, they were really involved in uh, a Penn State study, uh, which was uh, it's still ongoing for many, many years. And my, uh, my uh, person I reported to, uh, Highland Johns, was in charge of that. Well, the ESERCO, which was the, um, let's see, Empire State Electric Energy Corporation, they came out with a research study to look at uh, the effectiveness of uh, all their management, management techniques. And obviously, uh, we had a relationship with Bramble and Burns. Uh, Highland wanted me to get involved, so and I was happy to do it, uh, so I put a team together, we put a proposal together, and we got to study. So we studied, we were involved in that for six, eight years uh, till we f finished the project because it kept on going. Very successful project. Uh, and so that's, that's what got me into the utility business, quote, the utility business, and um, then it built from there. Dennis, obviously, I've I've heard a lot of the stories through uh, Phil's lens, right? Um, you know, in terms of how you guys, uh, well, where it started, just like you said, and then how you were able to build, you know, a, an incredible market position. Um, what I'm fascinated by is, you know, at that time, given your background you had some entrepreneurial juices to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this company from this large elephant, build something, and then sell it back to them, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, 
So, so were you this like organically developed entrepreneur or did you always have this, uh, have this personality and, and, and this, uh, skill set, or did you kind of learn on the fly? I have, uh, five brothers and a sister and I was, I was in the middle. Everything was pretty competitive there in the farm. Uh, let's say even in high school, uh, all my brothers were sort of towed the line. They worked on the farm. They didn't do any type of athletics or anything like that. But I was, I was always a black sheep in the family. I was always doing something they didn't want me to do. And so I went out for sports and I played all these things. And my dad wasn't happy with me, actually. Uh, I would go to school, do sports, come home at 8 o'clock, and all the chores I had were left for me. Oh, so boy. I guess it started there, so almost every night I wouldn't get done until like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, so I guess somehow that built my idea that I wasn't going to toe the line. And I Got was it. sort of taking my own course. So I think probably that's the way it started. And uh, I, I A never... A rebellious farm kid, huh? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. So I think that's how it started. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And and at the time when you say you bought the company, um, what were you buying at that point? The naming rights, the a little bit of reputation, a handful of clients. Like, what was what was actually purchased? Well, let's back up a little bit. Um, I hope we get into the vegetate our our line clearance programs, but. Uh, that's in the background. That's already happening. So the reason I bought the company was we were doing these vegetation management programs for utilities. And um, when we started, we, we relied a lot on contractors, Asplund and other contractors to give us information so we could be effective. Uh, by the time I was bought the company, we were all pretty smart, right, Phil? We knew all these things, and we were questioning what the contractor said, and we, we just didn't follow them anymore. We were doing our own thing. But we were going to utilities, doing vegetation management programs. As a result, the result of that, you have to present it to the brass. Uh, most of those programs are presented to presidents, vice presidents of the companies, because maintenance was the biggest uh, budget item in their budget. That's where they spent most of their money. So anyway, we had a program that could uh, justify what they did and how much they spent, right? We In Connecticut, we did a study for one of the Connecticut utilities, and uh, we had some people who were not too happy with that because they were starting to trim trees another way, which was the right way. And he wrote this article, actually put a full-page ad in the Audubon Society book that said, Aspen is scooping all the utilities, and they send out these guys to do their study, and then they get all this additional work, and it's just a scam. Well, <clears throat> that was just a ticket for me, because I was ready to get out then. So... I told them I can't work under this situation and my consultants don't want to work and I'm just not going to do it. So eventually they sold me the company. So that's how I bought the company. So Dennis, uh, you talked about the research in New York. That would eventually be some of the most significant research behind integrated vegetation management that everybody uh, strives to uh, do. Oh, One yes. Day, the, yeah. Yeah, that's a transmission. But you got involved in the distribution side, if, side, if I recall, when you got a call from Minnesota. So how did you get into those programs? One of the vice presidents of Asplund was trying to get to work at Minnesota Power and Light. And in order to do that, one day he went in and said, oh, I'll tell you what your workload is. And they said, oh, great. So he went out there and he did this survey of some kind. I don't know how, how much. But he came to me with all these numbers that he had, and he said, Dennis, i got to put this in some kind of report. Will you help me? Well, I did. We put together what we knew, what we didn't know. We made some things up, and uh, we submitted the report. It was probably about 10 pages, maybe 12. <laughs> and that was in the early 70s or, or late 70s, early 80s. And they loved it. And I think I told you this before, Phil. 
uh, not long after that, I was up north doing some work on the circle, probably coming back with my wife, and I said to her, this is a gold mine. I said, hell, this is worth millions of dollars because nobody has these kinds of programs. So that's how it all started. Yeah. So when I left in 2006, we had done 160 programs. So a lot. So it was the idea of workload-based budgeting, which nobody had at that time. In that time period... Uh, there were very few foresters in the industry, uh, a handful maybe, and they were doing fairly good jobs. But most of the utilities put retired linemen, or uh, how shall I say, linemen who couldn't work on lines anymore, they put them in charge of the line clearance programs. And the, when they, every time it came to budgeting, they'd go to the contractors and say, what do we need? What do we need? Come on. So the contractors would tell them what the system was like, and that's what they would turn in. Or they would say, oh, we just need 5% more. They had no clue. They really didn't know what was out there. So I realized that this could, could really turn out to be great. So we started, the whole process started with... Uh, the fact you, he did a survey, and when they did a survey, they, did, uh, they looked at trims and looked at removals and what types of trims, and that was it. And that's how we started. That's where you came in, Phil. Uh, we started, we weren't very good at it, and uh, you came in and brought in statistics, which is what we really need, and then everything started to happen. Now, we didn't just look at whether it's trims or removals or what type of trims. Uh, we also decided that uh, we needed to figure out uh, species. We needed to know what was out there. So we did that. We knew the species. Suddenly, then we figured out, well, we need to all faster grow on. So we developed a system to determine. We went out and actually took cuttings all over the place to see how fast the, the major trees, or I, should I say the the trees that grew the fastest, uh, how, how, how long would it take for them to get, the cycle, get into the lines given a certain clearance, right? So what we're trying to do is get a cycle, cycle of trimming. Okay, so once we figured out how, what types of trees they were, what, how fast they were growing, then we could say, okay, if we went every three years and we came back, we'd have X amount of trees in the, 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 the lines, right? So now we had some data. So then we had to somehow sell it to utilities that how do you get your system into control? So we found out through a lot of process, mostly with you guys uh, 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 figuring all this out, but what we figured out is that if we spent X amount of dollars to get the system once over, totally trimmed, and then if we knew what the fastest trees were growing, we would put you on a cycle. So we would go to the utility and say, if you get over the system one time, it'll cost you, let's say, $15 million. But if you come back three years later, you could do that whole system for seven million. And they'd say, why? And we'd say, because the fastest trees are the only ones that are in the lines now. The other ones haven't grown that much. So it, it, it was a perfect philosophy and formula because the utility brought top brass bought it. We would go to the PUC, Commission, Public Service Commission, and we would give them that same type of concept. If you invest it now, then later it would be much cheaper and you could maintain it at that cheaper level. So it was a, uh, some, as we went along, it just was a perfect storm for us because it was really so easy to sell. And, uh, and we were right. We were effective at it. So we, we, now we developed something that everybody wanted. 40 or 50 years later, I think it's over 95% of the utilities are still on 
a cycle-based program that you recommended. So yeah, might finally be moving on, but uh, that is the uh, standard that was put out there. Well, it was interesting, Phil, and you know this, is that when we went to utilities in regions of the country, the east, the south, the west, uh, pretty soon we had a, a, a pretty good database of what trees were the major trees of concern and how fast they were growing. So we had this all over the country. So it was, as we kept going, it was easier and easier to, to sell. Uh, and, and it was effective with less and less work on our part. So it was, it was, it was a great program. And I think a million dollars wasn't even close to what it was worth. <laughs> <laughs> so Tej has, his company has several hundred uh, contract utility arborists or uh, line folks, different contract positions. You were the first one to sell that service. How'd that, I told people the other day, and I hope I got the company right. Well, it was uh, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma oh, yeah. Gas and Electric? Uh, Oklahoma Gas and Electric. It was almost by default. Uh, at the same time, we were doing these, these uh, shall I say, uh, design studies in Philadelphia. Oklahoma Ga Gas and Electric came to us and said, uh, we would like a Forester, but there's no way we can get it in our budget. Would you guys consider uh, giving us one and we'll contract you for it? Well, that's like money in the bank. So I said, oh yeah, we can find somebody, absolutely. So we found somebody, went out and found somebody and, and they loved him and he worked there for like, I don't know, five, six years. Worked at Oklahoma Gas and Electric under their control, under their supervision, uh, under their liability. It was just such a great, great situation. Uh, then uh, Detroit Edison uh, was trying to get away from the contractors doing the uh, notification of the property owners. And we bid on the contract. I remember to this day, it was a bid on it a week before Christmas, and it came in the day before Christmas, and they wanted the people out on new, right after New Year's. Spent all my Christmas trying to find foresters. <laughs> I had to get 12 foresters out there in a week. Uh, but that was the start. We, this was, uh, in that situation, we were responsible for them, and we, we were getting the notification permissioning uh, and it was a contract. But soon it was catching on that people just thought, you guys can provide foresters for a, little, a lot less than we can provide them for. So they started contracting us to put them on their system. And, and they would, again, supervise them, tell them what to do and how to do it. And it, it turned out at one time, I don't know how many people we had out there. I know at one time we were 350, 400 foresters out in the industry. We were one of the largest <laughs> employers in the country. <clears throat> but here's the exciting part, Tesh. What happened was every time a utility had a guy and they loved them, they would say, Dennis, we want to hire him. And I'd say, oh, yeah, sure, you can have him. Yeah, yeah, you can hire him, no problem. There's no, there's no problem here. How many people did we have working for utilities, Phil, that were, on the, that were now system foresters? Oh, yeah, probably hundreds. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that the industry grew off of those people. Yeah. yeah. Talk yeah. about, talk about so a business strange. model. It was, it was actually fun because sometimes yeah. they would say, oh, we, got, we like this guy. Can you find us a few more? And I'd send the guys that were really good, that did a good job for us, and we didn't mind parting with them because in the end, it was just so good for us. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. that's how we started. For, we call it Forsters Unlimited. And, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and from a business perspective, this was really the key to our success, Tesh, because doing the yeah. uh, veg vegetation management programs, they were cyclical. We'd have them and we'd be selling them and they'd go up and down. But now we had these Forsters, so this was our base this was the base, basically that paid our expenses. And then the vegetation management programs were, uh, I say, gravy fill, is that what I could call it? But it was, yeah. it was a place where we could uh, uh, do it quickly. I mean, I shouldn't say quickly, but we could do it. And if we didn't have any of that work, yeah. we, we had the foresters. 
Have you, Dennis, have you kept, I mean, I think you guys sold in the, I don't know, 06, 07, 08, somewhere in there? Yeah, 2007. 2007. And so over the last, call it 15 to 17 years, I mean, obviously you're in Florida enjoying life, family time, but have you been tracking the industry? Have you... Have you ever looked back and said, hey, you know, I wish I would have kept it and maybe added different, you know, things to it, things I wanted to do? Or were you happy to get out? And have you never looked back? Well, I got sick uh, back, I don't know, probably five years before I sold it. Uh, and I said to Phil one day, I said, Phil, uh, I can't work for the next three months. Uh, I want you to take over the company. You're going to be president and so forth. And uh, of course, he agreed. And uh, when I got better, I looked at everything and said, hell, he's doing as good or better job than me. Why should I get back into it? <clears throat> so uh, I let him run the company with the people he had. He's very successful. Well, there are two reasons why I sold the company. One, I was already 55. <laughs> but anyway, one was that we were doing work in the industry out in California, and uh, fire suppression was a real issue. And we were getting to the point where we couldn't find insurance. We went to, we were last of it was at Lloyd's of London, and yep. uh, they were questioning whether they wanted to, to, to uh, insure us anymore. And so... I either had to invest a lot of money and grow significantly or get out. Now, yeah. that in itself wasn't the factor. The factor was there was so much liability in California that, that I mean, sooner or later, something big was going to happen, would put us out of business. I mean, that's the way I looked at it. And... And I can tell you that after I sold the company, after I sold the company, there was a time when I said to my wife, can you live out of a trailer? Because I got sued for $86 million after a year, less than a year after I got out. And it was, it was, a, it was a claim that was, wasn't submitted till the day before the uh, period for submitting it was out <laughs> and and it was a mess and it was you know the next year and a half we we fought it and fought it and fought it and fought it luckily we had 30 million worth of insurance uh and i uh, well yeah. here's the key the reason it was so high tesh was because during that six-year period the state of california said the forest service could charge for in environmental damages and they said they could do triple environmental damages. So a claim that would have been 15 million now was 80 some. So uh, literally, I see. That's that's how it happened. So yeah. So when I was yeah. glad when I got out, I said, "This is glad I got out because I said to my wife, dear, how much money can you spend?" And she says, "Oh, I can spend a lot. Well, how much you're talking about?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, that, so there'd that, be a fire, and we'd sit around the TV just wondering, was you know, are we in on yeah. this one? And uh, yeah, no, don't miss you, those days, do you, Dennis? And no, and Tesh, it wasn't like we didn't even have to be responsible if we were anywhere mm. near. If that was our lines, I mean, it could have. I mean, the lines could have fell down. It didn't matter because mm. we were sued anyway. Yeah. So we were on every claim that we were that we were the lines we were involved in, right, Phil? Yeah, it just was amazing. You get caught up, we'd be the first one on the hook. So yeah, things no. haven't changed in that regard, but yeah, it, it's a complicated, definitely a complicated space. Um, liability insurance is still; those are themes today. You know, that you still have those issues, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say, yeah, we have some issues. I think, though, the one thing, you know, I think there's been continued evolution in the utility space and. I think risk management practices, I think the utilities themselves have really net net done a really good job of adopting stuff from the past, using technology and 
you know, look, it's 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 nature, so you're not always going to get it right. But I think for the most part, um, it's been very interesting for me to see, well, learn the history through Phil and through folks like yourself and then see where the industry is and where it's going. It's fascinating and I, it continues to evolve is what I would say. So I understand you have some retired lineman contractor now. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, it's very interesting because Phil and I talked about that. That's probably how you got into it. But Phil and I talked about doing that years and years ago. But I don't know. We could never get that service going. I think we spent a couple of years trying to do it, but we never really got it going. Yeah, you know, I, I, I give a lot of credit to, at least from, from we have a great team, right? Um, we don't often talk a, a, about our, our people, you know, on, on this forum, but given that you brought it up, I, you know, I'll mention the fact that uh, a lot of the people in our organization, they're, they're so good. One of the things they're so good at is their bedside manner, bedside manner with clients, bedside manner with with people in the field and i think linemen are uh, their own sort of breed yes, entity yes, they are. right and they're very different than you know your traditional let's say vegetation management professionals so you know understanding those nuances and having people that can communicate you know with with that group right um is is i think the key part that has allowed us to slowly evolve in that space as well so you know, I, I give credit to our people that our leadership that's in the gr on the ground, you know, creating that stability, because essentially that's our whole position is centered around quality, you know, like to simplify it for us. It's all about good work. If we can't if there's no path to doing high quality work, then we just kind of don't do it. We don't we won't pursue it if we don't see that we can actually execute something at a standard that is better than a previous standard that's been set and we can't see a path to it, we generally won't pursue that. Well, Phil, we had some fit, uh, similar philosophy. What was that our saying used to be? Do you remember? Oh, you'll have to remind me, Dennis. But I remember <laughs> you, quality was always the emphasis. Yeah, I mean, if we did something wrong and the utility wasn't happy, we went back and redid it. I mean, we didn't yeah. fuss with it. We no. We said, if you're going right. to do it, do what you say you're going to do yeah. and do it right. And if not, let's do it again. Yeah. So, yeah. No, that's... And if you're going to be late, they better know it ahead of time. There are all kinds <laughs> yeah. of uh, oh, yeah. axioms uh, you had. That, uh, yeah. We, yeah. We made up all kinds of things. Like even in our uh, studies, uh, one of the things uh, Phil and I are famous for this. We don't know how this really started, but might have been over a cool beer somewhere. <laughs> but we were <clears throat> we were trying to decide what is an acceptable amount of tree caused outages on a system. So uh, we knew a couple of foresters, a couple of companies that had fairly successful programs. The manager was happy, and I think we sort of looked at those and we said, "Well, we think maybe 10% would be a good deal. 10% of the outages, you know." And I think. I don't, I don't know which company we used it at, and uh, we said, and, and I remember we were sweating it out because we said, oh, yeah, this will get you under 10% tree cause outages, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and it worked, yeah. and I, I think that's become a utility standard now, 10% of outages caused by trees, but it, was, it didn't get developed from hard data. It was more of a gut feeling. Right, yeah. Phil? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do think there was a beer involved. <clears throat> yeah, we did. Well, you know, like Tesh, you know this because we were consultants. So people would say to us, uh, have a project and say, can you do it? And of course, Phil and I were very happy to say, oh, yeah, we can do that. Sure. We, 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 we can figure it out. And we'd get down and we'd say, okay, how are we going to do this, Phil? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've seen that before. Oh, you can no, do anything, uh, you just have to figure out how. Yeah, Tesh, because if there's nobody else in the space, you're creating, uh, you're yes. creating it. So it yeah. was, it was, it was challenging, but it was fun because there wasn't anybody out there that said we were crazy. Do you, Not many, anyway. Dennis, <laughs> are you? Do you have any interest, or have you, since you've been retired, you know, 
doing research or writing anything or have you stayed at all kind of active with your kind of former body of work or have you picked up some more social hobbies? Uh, I would say that I haven't kept up with uh, the industry very much. Most of it's been through Phil. Um, uh, I know I, I'm in touch with people. They call me, we talk, uh, you know, on yep. the social aspect, yes. But I've picked up other challenges, if you will. Uh, okay. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a golfer, so I do a lot of golfing. But uh, one of the I things like I do, and I'm very proud of that, is uh, I run two tournaments of every year for uh, prostate cancer research and also a vaccine for breast, ovarian, pancreatic cancer. And over the wow. years, over the years, we've um, raised probably three quarters of a million dollars toward that research through my golf tournaments. And That's great. Actually, I'm doing one next week, so they're always fun. They're always exciting. So, so where, I'm doing. Uh, where, I'm doing that where, kind of where work. Where do you host it? Well, where I do you host, host it. I host one in Pennsylvania, uh, in uh, near North Philadelphia, and I host the other one here in Naples, Florida. And okay. uh, I get like 110 people, and they're always very generous. And because you know, what you find out is, I, I didn't realize this. You know, when I got prostate cancer, I thought I was the only guy in the world that had it. Well, yeah. uh, God, uh, I bring it up here and can run these tournaments. And I mean, there's so many people, so many guys that have had it yeah. or are struggling with it. And they, they just don't know where to turn. And yeah. it, that's really been my life after, I've, after I retired. That's, I'm working. Let me put it this way. You got to ask yourself, what do you want this world of yours to look like? And then you got to ask yourself, what are you willing to do to achieve it? And that's my answer. Yeah. And of look, course, I mean, Phil's on Phil's under the same deal. You know, he's running this this charity. He's educating kids uh, in Belize. Uh, yep. He he's. He, can you tell him about your great program? And, are you allowed to and, do that? Of course. Well, he knows as well. I mean, Dennis I know, and Sue like, are supporters, and actually yeah. are uh, the ones that helped me get it started. So we do scholarships for kids in Belize. Uh, right now they get turned out when they're seventh grade if they can't afford it. And a lot of them can't afford to go on to high school. So uh, I think we're at about 150 scholarships a year. Uh, we had a group from the industry go down and we did some plantings at schools uh, to help cool them, help provide uh, edibles and things like that. Have another group going in June from the industry. Uh, we even we built, built a houses, church. We build churches. We yeah, build. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty. That. I think we have 35 people going in June, including well, you know, seven or eight. Everybody from the could use a little Jesus. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. There you go. <laughs> Do you know in that's a spirit. that's a that's a big deal now, in the high schools <laughs> and all over here. You see these little Jesuses sitting around with a little note that says, "Everybody needs a little Jesus." See them. Wow, I, I did not know that. <laughs> I haven't it's, seen uh, those. Oh yeah, they're all over. <laughs> Phil, Phil and I uh, share a love for for whiskey, so we've uh, on many on many travels. Phil has shared uh, obviously lots about you and the impact that you've had, <laughs> not just in the industry, but um, on other parts of of the world. And and certainly, I've gotten very intimately familiar with Phil's uh, philanthropic sort of impact as well, um, which is, of course, inspired myself. And, you know, we have our own sort of uh, education focused, um, you know, commitment and things that we do for the local community here in, in Texas. So um, I love it. I love that, you know, even within business and post, we can do this kind of stuff. It's yeah, great. doesn't it doesn't it just do wonders for your heart when you can do things for people. Uh, I know uh, Phil had that bug uh, when he left. He wanted to become a minister. And I, I said, oh, oh, my God, Phil, are you going to be a minister? I said, how long do you have to study for that? He said, oh, you can just go on the Internet and you can get a license in about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. However, you know, Phil built the church and went to... Go ahead. I did put a few years into the education. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, he went yeah. to Cincinnati and built this huge church, and 
And I think I think it's probably true, Tesh, and probably as you get older, the more it will happen, is that the older you get, the more you want to give back. And if you're at all religious, you become more so. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you're working hard all your life and you just want to... There's a lot of people who need your help. No, no no doubt. It, uh, look, I, you know, at this stage of, of, of my life, I'm trying to integrate it as part of my life and, you know, raising a young family, obviously helping lead some of the things that we're doing, obviously very fortunate to, to have Phil um, alongside me and, and us, you know, as we try to figure out how to continue to build on what you essentially started. Um, well, we're you congr- a lot of fun. Congratulations to you for finding Phil because he's one of the oh, best guys you. in the industry, and he's a oh, he's no a doubt. good reason why we were successful. So no doubt. And then my biggest, I appreciate that, Dennis. My my biggest challenge is, is is making sure Phil, you know, doesn't doesn't go towards any other hobby at this stage too much. I'm like Phil, come on, hang <laughs> hang out a little bit more, hang out a little bit more. So no, well, it's, um, I. I give it, you credit for picking that up. Uh, Phil was telling me your stories, and I'm saying, how the heck is he doing that? I mean, we, we yeah. couldn't pull that off, and here he's doing it. And Phil said, don't ask me, but he's, he's, he's pretty good at it. <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, Dennis, I, it, it's all the credit. I will give all the credit to our team. We just, I, I just love the people we work with. Um, obviously, Phil has been a key part in helping us kind of architect and think about stuff because it's very difficult. This is an industry. See, you you at least had some context when you started this entrepreneurial journey. Right, right? You're right. a landscape architect. You, you saw something. If you're coming in blind, you're very reliant on the expertise, but being surrounded by the likes of Phil and Steve and Tom and like, and then, you know, Adam and all the people, it, it helps. How did you, how did you get locked in or keyed into the utility industry that's what i want to know great question um you know and and this i give you know so much credit to to my business partner our ceo my dear friend craig craig taylor um craig is has this incredible knack um for starting and building companies like he i've never seen anything like it um across industries, like whether it's a financial, you know, uh, kind of energy type services type business or, uh, you know, real estate or it doesn't matter, right? He's very good at putting the pieces together, seeing the market opportunity, laying a foundation. And, you know, this started way back when it wasn't vegetation management where we just kind of dropped in. Um, You know, Craig, formerly a naval officer, you know, had you know, a friend, you know, saw a small opportunity. This gentleman was operating in the space and, you know, Craig can see something and then say, I'm going to build something around that idea. And like most of the companies we started, there was an organic starting point. You know, we dipped a toe, a toe turned into a foot, we were diving in. And then all of a sudden, once we're in something, you know, our, our heads are on swivels. Now we're paying attention but we, we were very much like, hey, bite off something that you can manage, do it well, and keep building. And that path eventually had us land on vegetation management, let's say, as, as something. Right. And then similarly, we are now able to do other things with the utility because we've been so committed to doing good work, working with the right people, emphasis on quality. And so that's we, – we kind of – built on that. You know, we're, we've never been in a rush. We're very patient. Um, and again, I think that's where Phil, yourself, me, Craig, we share that quality philosophy. And we believe long term that tends to win out. So we don't get distracted by the the short term waves of price and chasing things. We, we don't get distracted. By yeah, that. So, uh, you you sound like you have the same philosophy with quality was very important. I mean, yeah. you work for utilities. If you do what you say you're going to do and it's a quality product, they stick with you. They don't, yeah. they don't ever, uh, they don't go somewhere else. They'll stick with you. They're very loyal. They're very loyal. And they, are. they pay their bills. 
They pay their they bills. Pay their bills. <laughs> somebody they, said they to pay me. Their bills. <clears throat> somebody said to me once, well, what was your uh, accounts receivable like? I said, well, I think there was once that we, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> over all those years, we never yeah, had a one problem. Time, <laughs> one time, one, I think it was a $5,000 bill. That yes, the wrong that person approved the contract, and they wouldn't back yeah. it. But <laughs> and it was uh, it was the only time in all those years. I got to tell you a cool story. You like this one? Yeah. Remember when yeah, PG&E please. went bankrupt back in the '80s or whatever it was? It said mm -hmm. well '90s. Remember the 90s, first time probably. they went bankrupt? Yeah. Okay, we were doing a lot of work for them, and when they went bankrupt, we had uh, I think they had two and a half million dollars of our work they didn't pay, so. They kept coming. Uh, uh, after a while, after a year, we got this company came to us. Said, we'll pay you 85% on the dollar. And at that time, we said, well, we don't. I don't. Let's not do it. I mean, we don't really need to do it. We can get through this. And then yeah. it was 90%. And then it was something else. And then finally, they got back on their feet. And they paid us all our money back. Plus four and a half percent interest. It was the best deal yeah. we ever did. <laughs> oh yeah, that was That's fantastic. that was at the time when the market went crashing down. Yeah, yeah. and we came out of that smelling um, like a rose. <laughs> we we went through a very similar thing um, with the PG bankruptcy that was most recent in I think yeah. nineteen or eighteen nineteen. And so uh, similarly, like you know, there's the sharks came out looking to buy seventy cents on the dollar, seventy five. Yeah, and Fortunately, you know, Craig and I are surrounded by good mentors and we, we consulted a bunch of people on how to navigate that. But similarly, like, you know, we kind of patiently waited through it and we're able to recoup the dollars. But, you know, you mentioned something and I want to touch on this one thing. I, I, I think vernacular is important and I think it helps people think about how they should view a utility or how they should view a client. And we tend to think about the utility as a partner, whether like, obviously there's a dominant relationship, right? Like the utility is the one saying, Hi, I'm going to provide dollars. You're going to provide service, but we've always tried to view the relationship with balance. Um, and I think that helps because instead of you pedestaling the relationship, you're, you're in a position where you believe you have something to offer. And if everyone's operating with that mindset, you're not afraid to say to deliver news that people don't want to hear because you're honestly approaching the work. And I think that is when I was thinking about quality, I was like, I want to give Dennis a little bit more of a glimpse into like how we define that. And I think so much of it is in the mindset of how even a supervisor interacts at the executive level, how we interact at the accounting level, how we interact. So we've encouraged our people to view the relationship from a, the lens of partnership, not just, hey, like, we'll do whatever you ask us to do. That, that's just not a good business relationship. So we, we, we don't operate that way. And I'm so glad to hear that because that's the way we operated. Like, let's take the manage, management programs. We did the study and they yeah. would say, okay, back it up. And we'd yeah. say, yeah, we'll back it up. We're in this together. And they said, okay, we'll spend the money and show us that we can do this. And then they did it. Or they'd yeah. say, or it'd say, put your reputation on the line and go testify at the utility commission and see if you can get the money. And we do that. And we did. And we got through the whole cycle. And I mean, the people that used it, Phil, I, I, have you ever heard of any of our clients that were unhappy? We were so, no. we were so proud of our clients that when we would send out information, we sent them a list of all our clients and say, you call any of these people and get their opinion of how we did. It was yep. so fun doing that. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Well, Dennis, this, uh, you know, we, I could do this with you all day because <laughs> the stories I'm sure I'm going to try to pull out of you. So I definitely want to encourage you to do a part two with us where we can, we can tell some more stories, um, but <laughs> this was uh, this was fantastic. I love golf. My game does not reflect my love, so maybe one day we can tee it up, or I can come attend one of your. Maybe events. I can give you an advanced warning. You can come and uh, play with our group. 
There you my, go. My charity. Go. I'd love to have you come. There you go. I'd love to. Because you're to probably doing a lot of work here in Florida, right? I am. Yep. We're, I'm down there all the time. So there you go. On, on both West and East Coast. So um, let's talk about that offline and let's see if we can get another uh, podcast schedule with you where we can get some more stories because uh, I love hearing the history of this business and you were obviously a very important uh, part of the history. So thank you well, so much for thank, thank putting you this thing in motion. Phil and I have a lot of stories we're sort of not telling you yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that, Some that, we may not tell. Part, part two. Yeah, let's part two. Well, so, thank Dennis, you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, th this thank you for uh, putting me on. And I, I, you know, I like talking about the past. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate learning more about your company because I can see why Phil likes to work for you because you, you basically have the same philosophy we did. And no, I at that, that, you're going to continue to be very successful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah. again, thank you for today. Fantastic. Appreciate it, Dennis. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Trees and Lines, brought to you by Iapetus Holdings. If you like the show, please give us a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. If you have any questions or comments on any of our episodes or ideas for topics or guests, We'd love to hear from you. Please contact us at treesandlines at iapetusllc.com. We'll chat with you soon.